Hey, everybody. Welcome to Coalition the Sane, hashtag COTS. I am Denver Riggleman, your host, and former congressman for Virginia's 5th District, former senior technical advisor to the January 6th Committee, oh, and a former intelligence officer for the National Security Agency in the United States Air Force. So happy to be here, and we are interviewing Reed Galen today, co-founder of the Lincoln Project, independent political strategist, also has his own Substack Homefront, which is very enlightening. He's also advised Fortune 500, oh, check that, Fortune 50 companies, and was actually at the recount in 2001 as a staffer on Bush Gore. Ooh, wow, incredible background, incredible experience. So we're happy to interview him today. I hope you all have a lot of fun, so buckle up and let's get to work. <music> Good to see you, buddy. Yeah, you too. Yeah, welcome. Um, thanks for coming on Coalition of Sane. Um, you know, the first thing, because you've been you've been around a while, and I want to ask you about the uh, the Hunter Biden and Donald Trump trials, and the conflation of those trials, and how you see people from the far right actually trying to conflate these trials and try to compare them between Hunter Biden and Donald Trump. And I want to ask your opinion about the conflation of those trials, uh, and what your take is uh, really on what's going on right now with the weirdness that you're seeing out there. Um, well, first and foremost, thanks for having me, Denver. And, you know, so 24 years ago, it's hard to believe it's been that long. I didn't have a beard and I had hair on my head. And I was in Florida for five weeks during the 2000 recount. And I said to myself, nothing will ever be weirder than this. And every single year since then has been weirder than that. So it's like the Richter scale of political weirdness, right? It doesn't go up like 0.1, it goes up exponentially. And so if you had told me a quarter century ago, this is where we'd be right now, I, I don't think any of us would have believed us. On the Hunter Biden and Donald Trump convictions, I, you know, a friend of mine posted the yesterday, I think, uh, on social media, I promise not to vote for Donald Trump or Hunter Biden for president. And I think that's that's really the key, right? You have to make it a little bit funny um, and you have to be, you know, you have to be forthright about it, right? There's only one guy running for president who's now a convicted felon and his name is not Hunter Biden, it's Donald Trump. And I think the one thing that, you know, Denver from the political background that you and I come from is stating the case plainly, forcefully, and repeatedly. This isn't about Hunter Biden. This is about Donald Trump. Why do they need to make it about Hunter Biden? Because they sure as hell know they can't make it about Donald Trump. That is the absolute truth. And I have to ask you this. You were down at the recount in 2000. I did not know this, Reed. This is incredible. Uh, why were you down there? What position were you in when you were down there as far as were you in a political position or working for a specific uh, you know, group or, or what were you doing down there? So I had been an advance man for the Bush Cheney 2000 campaign. Um, and I can tell you that uh, I was in Austin on election night. And then, of course, as you know, uh, nothing happened, right? We had this big party in Austin. It rained America. cats and dogs and then nobody won. Uh, and so we're all sitting around uh, a friend of ours house, right? There's just eight advanced guys and gals just laying around watching TV, right? Cable news, which was still, you know, very, very in its infancy at that point. And one by one, our cell phones start going off. And it's it's the campaign office, you know, basically telling everybody, OK, you're going here, you're going there, you're going here. Uh, and so, you know, the next day and for the next month and you know change, I was in Palm Beach County uh, at the emergency operations center. Sometimes it was counting chads. Sometimes it was marching up and down, down gun club road. Sometimes it was handing out t-shirts. Sometimes it was literally watching a democratic counterpart run between court cases. I will say this just quickly. The most surreal moment was a friend, a dear friend of mine and I sitting in a back hallway in the EOC, uh, with two guys from the Gore campaign who were from New Hampshire, uh, and two Palm Beach County Sheriff's deputies. We sat there all night, and the big blue steel doors that were guarding the the ballots had a piece of red uh, um, evidence tape across it to prove that no one was there. And so, you know, for a night, everybody had to take the overnight shift one night to make sure that nobody was fooling around with the ballots. So it was like a skiff. It was like a sensitive compartment and information facility where you had to have a guard outside. That's pretty incredible. And yeah, except with four four advanced goons and two sheriff's deputies. Yes. 
<laughs> Golly, I, and you know, that's the other thing that I think people forget, Reed, is that, you know, listen, my family was Republican. There was no mm-hmm. Democrats in our family. And when you're talking about 2000, you're actually down there during the recount, working for the campaign. Nobody can say you were never Republican or never a true Republican. And the question I like to ask people, you know, in coalition is saying, I've had some incredible answers, like from Adam, you know, Adam Kinzinger and, of course. you know, things like that, you know, is, is the question because Reed, people have asked me this question and, and I sort of have an answer. Like when I lost it, the time that I knew that we had crossed the Rubicon into insanity in the GOP side, was there mm-hmm. a moment or a, a grouping of events or a time period Reed? And cause you know, cause I know how active you've been. Right. And actually going after Trump based on your belief and my belief also that he's completely unfit to be president. Right. Was there a time, though, where you said things have gone so sideways, I can no longer actively participate in the Republican Party as it's instantiated today? Um, I think there's the there's the emotional internal point and then the sort of official point, if that makes a difference. Um, it does. You know, it was really by the f- December of 2015 when it was clear to me, having again been in Republican politics my whole life, Denver, right? I mean, you, you, yes. you, you will appreciate this joke more than most people. Other kids went to summer camp. I went to the NRCC, right? So like I spent more, t- I've spent more time over more years and more decades than anybody probably in history at 310 First Street Southeast. Um, and so I would say that you know, it was when he came down the escalator, I thought it was a joke. I heard the speech. I thought it was awful. The things he said about Senator McCain, I thought that was it. The things he said about Megyn Kelly, who turned out to just be, you know, go back and forth based on where the wind was blowing. I thought that was it. And then just the con- continued insanity and the unwillingness or inability of the Republican Party as a whole to serve as a cleansing agent and the other campaigns, all of them, right, failing to understand that. By December, you know, we've got the Muslim ban. So for me, that was it. I was never going, I never supported the guy to begin with, but I certainly didn't want to support him. And then, you know, when it was clear in the late winter, early spring of 2020, or excuse me, 2016, that he was going to be the Republican nominee, that was it for me. I said, if this is where the party has gone, I'm done. I don't want anything to do with this person. He's bad for the party. He's bad for the country. He's bad for the world. He's bad for everything but himself. And so I remember just quickly sitting at dinner with a dear friend of mine who went on to be a senior member of the Trump administration saying, I can't believe you're going to get behind this guy. And he said, he's the leader of the party now. What do you want me to do? I said, you don't have to go along with it. He's the leader of the party now. And so, you know, for me, as, as close as I was to the Republican Party, I've never really been a party guy. I wasn't a young Republican. I certainly wasn't a college Republican. I was a campaign guy. And so, you know, right, you know, as he took the mantle of presumptive nominee, that was it for me. And I've never looked back and I don't know that I ever will. You know, you said that so eloquently, you know, for me, you know, I was elected in 2018 and Reed, you know, that, you know, it was really odd because I had put out a Facebook post in 2016 where I said I wouldn't vote for Trump or Hillary Clinton. And I actually did. And I think I might be the only Republican congressman who didn't vote for Trump. And obviously, I didn't vote for Trump in 2020 because, you know, my death threats were already over a thousand after my anti-QAnon speech right on the on the congressional floor. But you know what? It really did it for me. I was already down the road, you know, and and especially, you know, after I officiated the same sex wedding, you know, Reid, that that uh, that was sort of done in the Republican Party as as far as Trump being the party leader. But I remember him retweeting the tweet um, that Joe Biden and Barack Obama killed SEAL Team 6. Mm-hmm. I just think there's nobody above moron that could actually support this guy at that point. But it seemed like there was nothing that he could do to actually bridge that gap or to, to stop people from actually believing in him or voting for him or wanting to be close to him or wanting to have power given to him. And when you look at the current makeup, like the psychological makeup, and this is probably an unfair question, Reed, but you've been in Republican politics so much longer than me too. Why? I mean, if you look at the psychiatric sort of, um, if you want to do an evaluation of the J.D. Vance's mm-hmm. or the Tom Cotton's or the Tim Scott's or the Christy Gnome's, right, or even the Nikki Haley's who said she would vote for Trump, what do you think it is, Reed? I mean, seriously, I, I, I've, I thought I had answers, Reed, but I feel like I'm just sort of grasping at air and looking through fog to find out what these people are actually thinking at this point. 
Well, I think that you, let's take the the results, the number of votes he got in 2020, which is an unbelievable 75 million, but it makes it also easy, Denver, to, to break into three tranches. So I think there's a third, maybe it's even more now, uh, of people who are the true MAGAs. They're the true believers. They will never leave him no matter what. He could say all the crazy stuff like he did about Osama bin Laden and SEAL Team 6, and I want to come back to that in a second. Then there's the other 25 million, you, you know, another third who are, I'm a Republican, he's a Republican. Um, I've always believed that Democrats are closet communists, and you know, no matter how crazy and wacky he might be, this is where my party is. This is where my belief lies. And if he's if he's running again, I'm going to vote for him. And then there's the last third who are nominally Republicans. Um, you know, look, this is the way I vote. Yeah, he's kooky, but, you know, taxes, you name it, right? Taxes, the border, whatever, whatever the issue du jour is. Um, but like Trump and SEAL Team 6 and the people that you mentioned, I think it's scarier. He didn't believe that. And I think that's actually scarier than him believing it because he didn't care whether or not it was true. It was a means to an end to incite chaos, divisiveness, question, you know, the the institutions of our government, of of our military, of our presidency, of the White House, because it suited his purposes. And I think that's the other part with, you know, Ted Cruz, Hawley, all of them is this suits their purposes in this moment. When J.D. Vance thought that it was important to be anti-Trump, he was anti-Trump. When he decided that it was important to be pro-Trump because that was the easiest way to win a primary and ultimately win a Senate seat from the state of Ohio, that's where he was. These people lever around nothing but ambition and power. And I think that's true for Trump too. And so for, I I think it's, it's an important dividing line between those that are there for the power, like the Vances and the Stefanics of the world, and those are there that are there for the belief, which are those hardcore people who probably, frankly, Denver weren't that politically active before Trump showed up, but he drew them into the political mainstream because he said the things that maybe they thought while they were sitting in their cabin in the woods, but knew that no polite society would have them. You're talking about J.D. Vance. Um... You know, this is a guy that actually, and, and Reed, I think you're a pretty rough and tough guy, to be honest. I think this is the guy, if I actually found him in an alleyway one-on-one, I don't know if I, I could stop myself from being a bit confrontational, right? And maybe it's my background in the military and things like that, too. But when you're talking about the, you're exactly right. I don't I don't believe Donald Trump be- believed his SEAL Team 6 tweet or retweet at all. But do you know he, who he manipulated on that tweet was Lindsey Graham. That was where the whole subpoena Obama, do you remember that? The hashtag subpoena sure. Obama or Obamacake came from was actually that tweet deck um, that Donald Trump was doing that actually came from Anna Kate, who was on season 32 of Survivor. Um, she actually put out that video on this weird news channel that was getting one, had 1. 1.7 million views. 1. Right. 1.7 million views, Reed. When she came out and said that, and it sort of went viral through the far right ecosystem. When you're looking at these people that are so easy manipulable, is that your biggest fear in the GOP right now? Is that they're gonna follow the party leader because of that cynicism no matter what? And is that the biggest thing we're facing right now with the United States that we have politicians with actually no moral compass? Um, Well, I think politicians and moral compasses um, have always not necessarily been bedfellows. So they've been mutually exclusive. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm I'm, uh, I I, I have a strong idealistic streak in me, but I also have a realistic streak in me, which is politicians are politicians. So we shouldn't expect more than them, more from them than we otherwise would. But I think, you know, the one thing that you're really hitting on here, too, is the idea that you know they will they are willing to make whatever argument they need to make at the time to be in the place they need to be for example a lot of the republican leadership you know driven by years of the nra or whatever the case might be believe that there should be no gun laws right well if there should be no gun laws then denver why was hunter biden on trial in the first place right because Amen. you know so but they're not going to talk about that because it goes against the other you know, the other insanity they have to go to, to the point about the coordination of the conference chair and the NRCC and the messaging, I think it's much bigger than that. And I think it's a much bigger thing that I think the the mainstream media doesn't understand. Our friends on the Democratic side of the aisle either 
don't understand it all or don't know what to do about it, which is this is an incredibly efficient, well-funded and relentless message machine. It it starts, you know, the Republican Party is just the political wing of the MAGA movement, Denver, but they have an incredible ability to move messages through you know, you, you talk about the, the congressional people, you talk about this woman who had 1.7 million viewers. You and I, I probably never heard of her and most Americans have never heard of her, but the people that want to hear from her know her. And so I think, you know, I, I think back to four years ago in New Hampshire, when I stood outside talking to some people that were about to go to a Trump rally and whether it was young guys you know, a middle-aged couple, an older group of older folks, Denver, this is four years ago. It's more sophisticated now. It was like they were, they had all gotten the same facts or the same email that morning about why they supported Donald Trump, why he deserved re-election, right? This is pre-COVID too, right? So this is, this is how far ago, how far along, you know, th- this, this machine has come. And so they are always, always, always on message. And they, the, the advantage they have right is that if you'll lie about anything you're happy to lie about everything so they don't have any compunction about telling the truth not telling the truth they will create the world and we have seen this and you have lived it with your QAnon experiences they create the world they need their people to stay inside and as soon as that world starts to crumble that's i think why something like the hunter biden thing becomes so crucial to them is donald trump as convict is unelectable to most americans i'd say the vast majority of americans and they can't have that therefore it has to be equitable and you know it's a it's an incredible way that you put that because right after i did the same-sex wedding i remember i think it was the first committee meeting after that read where everybody was wearing q pins i didn't even know what it right. was you know here i was I had this background in counterterrorism and you know, I'm looking at these people like, why is there a Q on that shirt? Like, what? why are everybody wearing things with Q on it? And Reed, I think what people don't realize that I was the first one that was really hit by QAnon, especially on the Republican right. side. I did that wedding <laughs> in July of 2019. Mm-hmm. By August, September of 2019, I'm being called Tool the Antichrist, General of the Sodomite Armies, right? And my wife at our distilleries was laundering money for George Soros. Those were the three big you know, things sure. that were out there. And I was changing the sexual orientation of children, of course, right? Because if I officiate a homosexual marriage, right, or a same-sex wedding, you absolutely know I must also be something that wants to go, you know, a guy that wants to go after children, right? It's Well, because unbelievable. remember, in the backyard of your distillery, you're drinking the blood of Christian babies. Well, of course I am. Or, or you know what? And, and actually in the tunnels below Congress too, right, Reed? Um, you know, yes. there's, you know, it's everywhere, right? So I think that's the thing too, is that, you know, when I was accused of doing those things, I'm like, how are these people out here in Halifax County, Virginia? And Reed, you know, you know, there's not a great internet connection in Halifax County or Pennsylvania County. No, right? I got family I mean, in going, Bedford. I get it. I got family in <laughs> you Bedford. You get it, right? You, oh, you yeah. got family oh, in Bedford, baby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you know, so that's the thing, right? In Southside, the committees act as such an effective communication line and everybody's yep. on Facebook. Right. And yeah. everybody's, you know, on these private chat channels. I don't think, and this is why I'm actually giving you amazing credit here. I don't think the Democrats really understand how vast the right wing media ecosystem is and how that alternative media ecosystem can be spread through social media on the way they came in imagine. Well, I think on. that's right. I, I I remember meeting with a with a very wealthy donor last summer, about this time. Denver and they and this is a person with you know 10 zeros in their bank account right and <laughs> they said well what what can we do to counter this and I said you could give me every cent you have and it would probably take me five years to even begin to catch up because as we're trying to catch up on and I call it the pro-democracy side Denver they're expanding their reach I mean there was just a story uh, as you know as we record this yesterday that Sinclair um, you know, which owns a bunch of local news stations, was pushing a bunch of BS through their quote unquote commentaries into the local news. You know, the radio stations, the, the TV stations, all of this stuff. And, you know, I once asked a Democrat who, who had a lot of experience in the, in the professional media space, right, the news space, why can't, why can't left of center, you know, wealthy people go gobble these things up and what they said was if you needed 20 million dollars the answer is well tell me when you get the first 19 and i'll come in with the 20th whereas wealthy conservatives and i want to call them republicans wealthy maga 
donors, right? As you know, Denver, they spend because their investment is on the future of the country, on their viewpoint of the world, and the willingness to be at the forefront of changing a culture that they know is going against them for their own purposes, whether or not that's ideology, whether or not that's wealth. And it's something that really most normal people don't understand, and certainly most Democrats have no conception of of, of contemplating because it's not how they see the world. That's Miriam Adelson came off the top rope again, didn't she, Reed? You know, and yeah. you're looking at Bill, you know, you look at they're gonna come back home. They're gonna come home to roost. They can they can be mad right after January sixth, but the the MAGA, as you said, or the far right wing billionaires are gonna come home. They they always come home. It's gonna happen. And and you're right. I mean I, I've been trying to people to you know, you need to understand how effective that messaging is and everybody looks at me like, well, you know, everybody can't be that stupid. I'm like, oh my God. Listen, if you're talking to a vast majority of people who believe they have a direct line to the supernatural, they're going to believe a lot of things. Amen. And if their leaders, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, if, and if their leaders are telling them these things, they're going to believe them. And the, the hardest thing that I have, the, the thing that gets me is I honestly thought back in 2019, 2020, read, and you're going to laugh. You're going to say, Denver, Jesus is a former intelligence officer. How could you be so naive? Mm. I really thought that I, if I had a fact-based message, that I could I could actually source it, that I could actually push it down and say, hey, right, this is what I'm doing. You guys need to understand what I'm saying. Here's my sourcing. What you actually believe isn't true. I thought that would work. It didn't, Reed. I, I, no, of course not. It, did, it didn't work. It didn't work. And the only thing I could do was to try to find an emotional argument or maybe one little thing to grab onto. For instance, saying, hey, you think the election was stolen from Donald Trump. Why didn't all the Republicans also have their election stolen on the same ballot? And right. And sometimes I'll get a pause. I'll right. get some hesitation because you're, because you're introducing that cognitive dissonance that they that they have to hold two two thoughts in their heads that don't comport with reality. Well, I think that they've perfected it so well, Reed. I don't know how we actually break that cognitive dissonance when you're looking at Donald Trump and looking at evangelicals who are supporting a guy who had no problem. I re-listened to the Billy Bush tape, Reed, you're like probably like, damn, Dad, you were into this no, talking sure. to me today, right? For and sure. As you talked about all the things that he did, right, that that really turned you against him, but, you know, the grab him by the pussy comment, right, when it came out, it didn't seem to actually touch him at all with the evangelical base. And at that point, a lot of people are saying, well, look at the things he's doing. Some people are going to turn away from him. Reed, I would humbly submit to you, as somebody who's been in this game longer than me, mm. that if they didn't leave Trump, after that comment and after stormy daniels and after being found liable for sexual assault i don't think they're going to leave them now bud look they're not going to leave them denver because it's all a means to an end and we have to remind ourselves trump is a carnival barker trump is an he is he is uh you know all of these guys he's pat robertson he's billy uh what you know uh, all <laughs> those graham, old guys are franklin billy graham, graham. Franklin Graham, yeah, I mean, all Jimmy of them. Jimmy Swagger. Right? Swagger, <laughs> oh, right? Um, the, it, he, is, he is of the same makeup, right? He, he convinces a bunch of people in things that are completely BS, and he convinces them to give him millions of dollars so he can fly around on a private jet. He's no different than them. He's exactly the same. And here's the difference, is they see him as a vehicle they don't care about any of the things he's done a because there's a good chance that many of them have done the same thing or that their you know youth pastors are doing far worse as we see almost on a daily basis but here's the thing they you know whether or not it's the it's the evangelicals the leonard leos and the opus day people or or any of the proto nazis and that white nationalists you know they got you know what's the definition of luck Denver. It's when preparation meets opportunity. Donald Trump was the opportunity that met their decades, decades of preparation. Decades. And they're not going to let go of them now because here's what they know. This to them, Denver, is an existential fight for the way they see the way the, way the world should be and their way of life and their way of life. Culture is going against them. Demographics are going against them. History is going against them. They know November 5th, 2024 is the battle for everything for them. Because once Trump goes, yes, there will be other acolytes, but none of them will be as pliant or pliable as he is because 
he and they are riding in the same insane clown car together, the it clown car together, into oblivion, and they don't care. They don't care about anything else other than power, money, and the ability to tell you and me and our families and everybody else how to live their lives. It's almost like uh, uh, a serial adulterer, um, con man, and criminal is the general for their their ride into spiritual warfare, right? And it's just it's just amazing to me. What happens in 2024? What are we looking at as far as the election season in 2024? From your from your perspective, um, let me start with the good news. Um, there are more of us than there are of them, and I know that it's very impolitic to put things in black and white anymore. But as you know, Denver, more than anybody, politics is a binary game. You win or you lose in an election, right? We don't have multi-member districts. We're not parliamentary. In this election, someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. Um, and so there are more voters available to Joe Biden. There are more people who are either registered as, as Democrats in these key electoral college states or who should vote for a Democrat because either they're independents who want nothing to do with Trump or they don't like the abortion issue or whatever it is. And enough Republicans like us who have just washed our hands up of a guy like Donald Trump who should either hold their nose and cross, cross the, the aisle for Biden like so many did in 20 and 22 or stay home, right? An undervote is just as good, right? It, it, it will take it an It surely undervote. is. <laughs> but what concerns me is, you know, frankly, our friends on the Democratic side of the aisle, as I've said, you... you I can't believe we ever lost to them, Denver. I can't um, because they're unwilling or unable to see the threat. Joe Biden is a fighter. He is a boxer. Let him be who he is. Go out and do the things he needs to do. And then you all go out and take the fight to this man. Right. I, I don't know how many t different times you have to tell him trying to get Trump on policy or the fact that he's a jerk. The people that love him, love him because he's a jerk. Denver, right? You're not going to peel them off. You have to remind enough Americans that they want nothing more to do with this man. And you must do it in a calculated and brutal way. And you must do it repeatedly. That's not democratic politics, unfortunately. It was the politics of the Barack Obama campaign and the Bill Clinton campaigns, right? They were happy to let their guys go be killers politically, of course. Um, but this is a time now when our friends on the Democratic side of the aisle got to say, is this a fight you want to win? Because right now I'm hearing too much of people to go back to Sun Tzu, right, who believe they're already beaten. And what's the fastest way to make sure your opponent can't win? To make sure that there's nothing they can do to win. And Denver, I, I know you and I, are, we're not going to fall into that camp. We'll be going through this for the next hundred and so many days, right? And we should remind everybody, too, that election date is not November 5th. It starts sometime maybe late September in some places. Late September. Early October. And early, early October in others. Well, you know, if I could make it succinct, my dad, when I was a bouncer, he said the fight doesn't start <laughs> till you're on the floor, right? And um, that's really what it comes down to. The, state, the well, fight doesn't start the bar till you're on the floor. In all the bar fights I've been in, I've been in multiple, unfortunately. I Somehow I, mean, I always started on the floor <laughs> and got up. <laughs> well, that just makes you tougher, right? And you know what's scary? You know, it's almost like, and, and to end here, when you're talking about that, there is a toughness issue with the Democrats. But my biggest worry is we're going to go from the Jimmy Swaggart, um, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham, to almost a David Koresh, you know, type of, uh, you know, type of worship, right? Um yeah. It's just getting so nuts out there. And I think that's the thing that really bothers me is that it seems like it's getting more uh, virulent, not less virulent. And that January 6th was just a test case. And, you know, that's kind of the stuff that I think that worries me the, the most. And, you know, also, I want to ask you really quickly. And, and Doug, I, I see that you just uh, and it's lovely uh, to ask you about home front. Sure. Uh, yeah, so listen, um, you know, the home front is my sub stack. I hope everybody will visit it and sign up if you're interested. But this is, you know, I write once or twice a week, uh, Denver, and this is where I give you my thoughts on maybe the issue of the day, maybe a little bit of political philosophy, maybe some history. Um, but the idea and, and also, uh, you know, a lot of pep talks, both to our friends um, who are former Republicans and the Democrats we fight alongside. I, I know that you know, I think of ourselves a lot, Denver, as as 
you know, like the French, you know, the Democrats are the French army in World War One, and we're the British army on the left wing, right? We're not Democrats. We're not of Democrats. We're not likely to be Democrats. But here we are. We're fighting along the same line. And so the home front over on Substack is an opportunity for folks to hear about how I see the world, you know, more experience than I could have ever hoped for, but also a lot of experience understanding what Trump and Trumpism is and how we got to beat it. That's why we need people to su subscribe to your Substack, Homefront. Um, I'm going to, obviously. And I think it's amazing what you're doing right now, Reed. And I'm glad you're in the fight. I hope the Biden campaign reaches out to you. I don't know if they have already, but I hope they do. I uh, hope they get a little bit of that scrap going because, but if you've been in bar fights, you know, again, you're right. You know, you could start from the floor or start from the top, but that fight does not start till you get somebody on the floor. And uh, right. I think the Democrats need to know that. And, I just appreciate you being on here today, Reed. No, thanks, Denver. Thanks for everything you've done, not only in your career in the military, but in Congress, but now here on the front lines along with us. And I, I thank everybody who's listening and watching, and then we'll see you out there in the States. you damn right. Thanks, brother. I'll see you. Thank I'll you. see you Friday. Yes, thank you. I'll see you soon. <laughs>